Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this interview, Cruncher, gaining insight how war in Ukraine impact global food supplies. I'm Sadia Kainzik, head of communications at GAIN and moderator of this episode. Before February 24th, the world was the theater of a double whammy of drought and catastrophe stemming from climate change and the COVID pandemic that hit us really hard. Now, with the war in Ukraine, and in just a few weeks, we see that millions of people may be put into harm's way, going far beyond Ukraine. De-escalation is key. Today, our panelists, all from the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, will try and give a prismatic view of what this war will entail from a food shortage spectrum. Stella Nordhagen, our expert in knowledge leadership, will give us some facts and figures and proof points on the trends we see and potential implications for global hunger. Lawrence Haddad, our executive director, will give the global perspective of such impact and what key stakeholders can do to counter it. Wubit Girma, the new country director in Ethiopia, warm welcome to her, will give the country and sub sahara perspective. Oftentimes, Africa is said to be the breadbasket of the world. Could they step up? And Pinjaniam Kambula, our global program lead for large-scale food fortification, will speak about one effective tool that works when everything else falls apart, and that's food fortification. Why it matters, especially when faced with food insecurity. Lawrence, from what Stella has described and what the war means for the world's food supply, we see prospects that things won't look that good. I wonder if you could expand on how the war dynamics here is unlike any other we have currently. Thank you, Sadia. I mean, what's, what's different about this war, uh, this invasion, is that it's happening in an enormous piece of land that is one of the breadbaskets of the world in terms of wheat and barley and sunflower. It's, it's just a critical producer for the region and for the world. And so when you have this disruption uh, happening, you're going to get a disruption in food production. So food production in Ukraine, farmers should be getting their fields ready right now, but at the moment there's metal and slain bodies occupying those fields when there should be seeds uh, and, and water. So this is a big problem because Ukraine, as, as Stella mentioned, is responsible for a big share of global export of wheat and maize and barley and sunflower oil. That's the first problem. Second problem is that Russia is also a very important exporter of many of these foods and their production uh, and export is disrupted by the war effort and by the economic sanctions. Uh, for food, for sure, but also for exports of the nutrients that are so critical for fertilizers everywhere in the world, especially in, in Africa and North Africa. So in addition to that, you've got the price of energy going up because Russia is such a big exporter uh, of, of energy, oil and gas, and the supply for export and the demand from the other side has been curtailed. So because food production is such an important, uh, because energy is such an important part of food production, food processing, food distribution, uh, any rise in food prices, any rise in energy prices is gonna drive up food prices. So you've got this triple whammy of Ukraine exports being damaged, Russian exports being damaged of food, Russian fertilizer exports being damaged and the price of energy going up, these four factors are combining in a very, very toxic brew. Lawrence, in the scheme that you're just uh, sketching out, you said in an interview in Al Jazeera last week um, that we see a rerun of the Arab uprising. Uh, and we see things happening right now in uh, Morocco, in Sudan. So how could this be a test to country stability? Well, you know, this, this crisis is coming on top of two other crises. Um, the COVID crisis, which is maybe abating a little bit in Europe and North America, but it's not necessarily abating so much in areas that are not vaccinated, such as uh, Africa, 10-15% uh, of the population 
has had the full three treatments, still very low. And then on top of all of that is climate change, which is slowly but, but persistently and, and inevitably squeezing the life out of uh, many growing areas, uh, food growing areas. So you've got this conflict in, in the breadbasket on top of the other two crises. And all of this is putting a huge amount of pressure on food prices, which before the conflict in Europe was the food prices were there are the highest real level since 1975. And remember 1975 created the World Food Program. That's how big a deal those food prices were back then. Uh, so it's an even bigger deal now. And we know, we know that uh, food price spikes and food price volatility is one contributing factor to unrest, civil unrest. Uh, and we know that in many parts of uh, North Africa and the Middle East, food price subsidies are really critical, a critical part of the social contract between civilians, civil society and the government. Government says we keep the price of staple foods low and in return, you, you give us loyalty and fidelity. And so that contract, that social contract is under huge pressure because of the rising food prices. So, Lorza, how can governments, uh, key stakeholders, mitigate the effect of such war? Well, I think the first thing, the first thing is obviously there has to be a ceasefire and the war has to end or at least be put on pause. We must see an end to the weaponizing of food. Um, the Russian invading army has weaponized food. They are putting in place. Um, sieges of big towns, cutting off supplies of food and water. And this is a, a gross violation of human rights, uh, never mind just the right to food, but of all human rights. And this must, this must end you know, immediately, immediately. Um, the second thing that it needs to happen is that um, humanitarian agencies can't be scrounging around and begging for money. They can't wait. They need to get money now. The unprecedented sort of set of sanctions, the unprecedented military aid is, is needed. And the rapidity of what's happened is to be welcomed, but the humanitarian response also needs to be rapid and decisive and no, no haggling, uh, immediate action is required. In the, in the more modern, uh, medium run, um, I think what, what this has shown is that Whenever there's a, a war in a, in a breadbasket, whether it's in Ethiopia or Kenya or in, in places like Yemen or Syria, um, there's going to be damage everywhere. So we need to diversify the, the number of breadbaskets for the world. We, we can't just rely on five or six. There needs to be you know, uh, in numbers in the 20s and 30s. We need to diversify. In an uncertain world, diversification is a key solution. Uh, and for Africa, that means uh, really beginning to finally exploit the incredible potential the continent has. It has some of the richest soils in the world. Um, it has some of the most hardworking labor forces. It has rapidly growing income and markets. Uh, the potential for Africa is just to be a, a, a provider for itself and also for the rest of the world is, is immense. And now is the time for uh, governments to step up and invest in their agriculture and for the rest of us to help them. And finally, I think, finally, the really important thing, well, the, the next thing is that trade has to keep flowing. I think whenever there's a crisis, uh, exporting countries immediately clamp down on their exports and say, well, our, our domestic populations need the food. And it's very understandable that, that happens, but in a way, uh, history has shown that's a race to the bottom. Uh, everyone will lose out because of the lack of flow of food. Final thing I'd say, Sadia, is um, who, are the, who, are the, who are the people who are most affected by any crisis? It's always the, the poorest, the most malnourished. And within that group, it's the very young children. The very young children, the children in the womb, the children that are one year, two years old, their brains, their immune systems, their bones, their central nervous systems, their muscles 
are growing at an incredible rate. All the all the systems that are essential for their ability to survive and thrive are being laid down in that, that first 1,000 days. So we have to protect them from the ravages of, of conflict, climate, and COVID, because if we don't, uh, that will their 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 damage their their devastation will be the legacy of this conflict. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, just one last uh, question regarding gain. How do we fit into this equation? Well, Gain's mission is all about making sure that safe and nutritious food gets to the people who need it uh, in a, in a way that is available in markets and stores. It's it's affordable and it's attractive. Uh, it's desirable food, and so, you know, the getting getting safe and nutritious food is one of the first victims of any conflict, uh, because these kind of foods are they're easy to uh, they're more perishable. They become unsafe. They they spoil. They become rotten. So we have to keep nutritious, safe food flowing to people who need it, and that means keeping uh, the small and medium enterprises that produce supply, process, transport, market the food, keep them going with finance, with support. It means keeping food system workers who are the lifeblood of, of, the, of the food system. They're some of the most exploited workers in the world. We need to keep them safe and healthy and, and get nutritious food to them. It means keeping food markets open, often food markets closed, when there's a lot of uncertainty, we need to do what we can to keep them open. And also it means keeping um, supplies of staple foods, everyday foods that uh, are consumed by everyone every day, uh, grains, edible oil, uh, salt, these kinds of foods, keeping them fortified with essential micronutrients like zinc and iron and folate. These are things that are absolutely essential for human development and prevent prevention of illness. And, and birth deformities, these kinds of nutrients have to keep going. We will, we will redouble our efforts in all the countries we work in. We will work hard to get these messages onto the G7 agenda and the G20 agenda later on in the year. And we will work really hard to keep the most vulnerable, very young children protected and safe. Thank you, Lawrence.